everyone and welcome to this video for CIE exam board topic 7 selection and evolution. We're going to be going through everything you need to know for this topic and that is also what my A level notes do. It's all of the theory for the entire CIE A level including key terms, key marking points and examiner's tips and I've got that linked below for you if you want to get your hands on a copy. But for now let's get into the content. Topic 17 then we're going to be looking at selection and evolution starting with variation. So the genotype of an organism is its genetic constitution, which basically means the alleles that they have for a particular gene. Whereas the phenotype of an organism is the observable characteristics determined by both the genotype and environmental contributions as well. So for example, you have a combination of genes that genetically determines the maximum height you could grow to. But the environmental factors, such as your diet, will determine whether you reach that maximum height. And that would be your phenotype, which would be your height. An example for plants is chlorosis, so the yellowing of leaves. Plants have genes for chlorophyll production. However, environmental factors, such as lack of light or mineral deficiencies and viral infections, can reduce the production of chlorophyll. So thinking about this concept then of variation, we can categorize it as continuous and discontinuous variation. And data representing continuous variation would be presented as a histogram, whereas data representing discontinuous data would be represented as a bar chart. And the differences between these two types of variation are summarized in the table below. So continuous variation are characteristics with continuous values. So for example, your height or the height of a plant or birth weight. Discontinuous variation would be categorical values, so discrete values. So for example, which blood group you would have. Continuous variation is caused by your genetics and interactions with the environment, whereas discontinuous is just genetics. Like your blood group isn't going to change because of what environment you live in. And then the final comparison is the number of genes involved. Continuous variation, the reason that there are a continuous range of traits that people could have for that particular characteristic is usually because there are many genes and many alleles for those genes involved, so polygenic. Whereas discontinuous variation is normally controlled by one, possibly two genes. So then we go on to looking at natural and artificial selection. Natural selection is the process that leads to evolution in populations. And evolution is the change in allele frequency over many generations in a population. Natural selection results in a species as a whole becoming better adapted to their environment. And those adaptations could be anatomical, physiological or behavioural. So let's just go through then the process of natural selection. First of all, you always have variation, genetic variation within the population. And that is because new alleles for a gene are created by random mutations occurring. If this new allele provides a selective advantage, meaning it increases the chances of the individuals who have that mutated version of the allele to survive in that particular environment, then they're more likely to survive and reproduce. And therefore they pass on potentially that advantageous allele to the next generation. As a result, if this continues over many generations, that mutated version of the allele will now become more frequent in the gene pool of that population. And evolution is a change in allele frequency over many generations. So that is how natural selection results in evolution. Now there are different outcomes of natural selection or types of selection known as stabilizing, directional and disruptive. And directional selection, this is when we can see here the y-axis would be representing the frequency of a particular trait or allele, the x-axis is that trait or alleles. And before selection, the middling trait would be the most common and the two extreme traits are less common. But directional selection is when in natural selection, whatever the allele that has the selective advantage, it is now one of the extremes. So in this case, it's the extreme at this end, but it could have been the one at this end. And therefore, 
over many generations of the individuals with the extreme trait being the ones survive, reproduce, passing on their allele. Over many generations, we end up with a loss of the extreme trait at the other end and the middling trait, and far more individuals will now have that one extreme tra trait. And this occurs when there's a change in the environment. Um, and an example of this is antibiotic resistance. So if we think about resistance as a scale rather than resistant or not, we've got this extreme would be not resistant, middling resistant, very resistant. The bacteria that were very resistant are more likely to survive because they're resistant to antibiotics. Stabilizing selection, this is when whatever was the modal trait, so the most common trait, that remains the one, the trait that provides a selective advantage. So stabilizing selection occurs when there is no change in the selection pressure or the environment. And as a result, even more individuals over many generations will have that middling trait. The extreme traits are lost. So we end up with this taller peak, which is narrower because we've lost those extreme traits. And so the standard deviation decreases because we have less variation around that mean. The final type is disruptive selection. And disruptive selection is when we have both extreme traits provide the selective advantage. And therefore, individuals that have either of those extreme traits are more likely to survive, reproduce and pass on those alleles. So those extreme traits both become more common and the middling trait is almost completely lost. And as a result, that allele frequency changes and more individuals have those extreme traits. Now, if this happens for many, many, many generations, it can ultimately lead to speciation. And what we mean by this, we'll go on to in more detail, but essentially those curves will become two separate curves and this bit would have been lost altogether. So we now essentially have two separate gene pools and they'd be so genetically different that they are counted as different species and therefore it is speciation. So next in the consideration of what genetic drift is, this is the change in the allele frequency within a population from one generation to the next. And there will always be genetic drift from one generation to the next because we do not produce cloned offspring. But it is the continual and substantial genetic drift that counts as evolution. And by that we mean there has to be a continual and substantial change in the allele frequency for it to count as evolution. And the smaller a population is, the bigger the impact allele frequency changes have proportionally. And this is why evolution occurs more rapidly in smaller populations. Next then, it's the concept of genetic bottlenecks and the founder effect. And these two processes have different causes, but the same outcome, which is a reduced gene pool. Genetic bottlenecks are caused by events that kill almost all of the population, leaving only very few individuals that survive. So we can see an example here. This might have been the original population size. An event happened, which maybe it was some kind of natural disaster that killed off almost all of the population. And now the population size is very small, so we don't have very many individuals at all. Because we don't have very many individuals, the original population, gene pool, might have had lots of different alleles, but by chance, the ones that survived, which we can see in this example, were the green and yellows. We now have very few different alleles for a particular gene. So the gene pool has decreased. And that's what we've got written here, that many alleles for the genes are lost. And that means the remaining breeding populations are going to be reproducing and passing on the same alleles. And as a result, we get this lack in genetic diversity. And as a result, more genetic diseases will exist in that population because you have few individuals reproducing, which have very similar genetics, and therefore they'll be constantly passing on the same alleles, which if they happen to code for inherited diseases, you'll continually be passing on that genetic disease. The founder effect is when a few individuals from an existing population will migrate to an isolated area. 
Now, this also results in a small gene pool and a small population size reproducing together. So you get exactly the same effect. You lose some of the alleles. You constantly have the same individuals reproducing together, passing on the same alleles. So you have a lack of genetic diversity. It's just the cause is different. Instead of it being due to many individuals dying out, it's a small number migrate and isolate themselves. And that's actually what happened with the Fugates in Kentucky. They isolated themselves to um, a particular area in Kentucky. And some of the individuals that went had a rare genetic allele that codes for blue skin if you have two copies of that recessive allele. But because of the limited gene pool and the number breeding together was very, very small, that meant that that recessive blue allele became quite frequent in the population. And you then had many individuals in that population who had two copies of this blue skinned allele and it resulted in a population um, with many of the individuals having blue skin. So thinking about allele frequencies, the Hardy-Weinberg principle is a mathematical model which can be used to predict allele frequencies within a population. So just to recap on some of these key terms, the gene pool is all the alleles of all the genes within a population at one time. Population is all the individuals of one species in one area at one time, and they can reproduce to make fertile offspring because they're the same species. And then the allele frequency is the proportion of an allele within the gene pool. So Hardy-Weinberg involves two separate equations using these different components. We've got P squared plus 2PQ plus Q squared equals 1. And all of those parts are the different possible genotypes. So P squared is homozygous dominant. So if you have two copies of the dominant allele, 2PQ is one dominant, one recessive allele. So you're heterozygous and homozygous recessive is Q squared. And because all the individuals in the population have to have one of those genotypes, that's why if you add them all together, it equals one. This equation down here is for all of the alleles. And you either have the dominant allele, which is represented with the letter P, or the recessive allele, which is represented with the letter Q. So all of the alleles for that gene in the population would be P plus Q, and that equals one. So those are the two equations, but it's going to make a lot more sense if we go through an example, because you could rearrange these equations to work out the frequency of the dominant allele, the frequency of the recessive allele, or the frequency of any of those genotypes in a particular population. So let's say for this example, cystic fibrosis is caused by a recessive allele. That would be the letter Q, recessive allele. 0.02% of the population in the UK suffer from cystic fibrosis. What proportion of the UK are carriers? So always have this information at the top in mind and always start by working out what part of the equation do they want you to determine? What part of the equation have they given you? So first of all, we've been told that cystic fibrosis is um, a caused by a recessive allele. So if 0.02% of the population have cystic fibrosis, they must be homozygous recessive individuals, which is Q squared. So that means Q squared is 0.02%. We always convert it out of the percentage though. So that is Q squared. They want you to say what proportion of carriers. Carriers would be heterozygous, so 2PQ is what we are working out. So to work out 2PQ, we need to know what Q is worth and what P is worth. So Q squared is 0 0.002. So if we square root that, we've got what Q is. And we can then use this formula, P plus Q equals 1, to work out what P is. So P is 0.986. So we want to know what 2PQ is. So all we have to do is 2 times P times Q, and that equals 0 0.03. So that is what proportion of the UK are carriers. Sometimes they might ask you to convert that back into a percentage, and in which case that would be 3%. So genetic variation can be as a result of natural selection or artificial selection. We've already talked about natural selection. We've said that there is always genetic variation within the population because of random mutations creating new alleles. And then because of the environmental pressures, different alleles will have the selective advantage and be passed on. Um, and those selection pressures could be predation, 
disease, competition for resources. But those organisms that have phenotypes providing the selected advantage are the ones that are more likely to survive, therefore reproduce and pass on those favourable alleles to the next generation. So you get evolution occurring. Artificial selection is when humans are selecting which plants or which animals are going to breed together. So humans are selecting what they deem to be the favourable characteristics rather than it being naturally selected by the natural selection pressures. And this manipulates the gene pool so that favourable alleles become more common and less favourable alleles become less common. Now, this was particularly prevalent in creating dog breeds with particular features, such as pugs, which we can see up here, where humans selectively bred dogs that would have um, what was deemed to be really cute features, like squashed up flat faces. But because of this artificial selection, selecting for what we look, thought looked cute, it's actually resulted in a lot of medical issues linked to breathing difficulties for pugs because they have such flat nose, they struggle to get in um, enough air for ventilation. So some other examples of artificial breeding that you need to be aware of is the introduction of disease resistance to varieties of wheat and rice plants, inbreeding and hybridisation to produce vigorous uniform varieties of maize plants and improving the milk yield of dairy cattle. And the top two are artificial selective breeding that we were pretty much just thinking about in terms of the pug example. But then this one is slightly different because we've got inbreeding and hybridization. So for these three examples, just pause, have a read through what the steps are involved. You can always take a screenshot and print this to have in your notes. So finally, then we go on to evolution. And evolution, as proposed by Charles Darwin, can lead to the formation of a new species from one existing species over time through change in the gene pool over many generations. So genetic variation with populations within the population arises from random mutations that we've talked about. And from that, we get natural selection occurring where we have the advantageous traits are more likely to result in the individual surviving, reproducing and passing on. But if you have over time reproductive isolation, which is when you have one species, one population of that species, but they become isolated so that they are no longer reproducing together, whether they're isolated because of some geographical barrier or differences in their behaviour, you get speciation, which is the formation of a new species. And by comparing the DNA base sequences of the same gene in different species, you can examine evolutionary relationships. So the more similar the DNA base sequence, the more closely related two different species must be. And that's because they must have evolved from a common ancestor more recently, as there are fewer differences in the DNA base sequences, and therefore there must have been less time since they evolved for mutations or different mutations to accumulate in those different species to create the changes in the DNA base sequence. So speciation, then we said it's the process of creating a new species. It occurs when one original population of the same species become reproductively isolated, whether geographically or due to their behaviour. And this isolation means there are now two populations of the same species, but they're not breeding together. And because they're not breeding together, this can result in the accumulation of differences in the gene pools because they're going to be reproducing separately with individuals in those reproductively, reproductively isolated populations. So different alleles are going to be passed on. And eventually they could become so different in their gene pools to the extent that the two populations would be unable to interbreed to make fertile offspring. And that's when they're then classed as two different species. There are two different ways that populations become reproductively isolated, either due to a geographical barrier, which is known as allopatric speciation, or it could be changed in the reproductive mechanisms and behaviours. So even if they're in the same location, they're not reproducing together, and that is sympatric speciation. So a bit more on allopatric, where it's due to geographical isolation. We could have a population becoming geographically isolated over time, maybe by a new mountain range or new bodies of water separating land masses. This separates the original population into two, which are now unable to reproduce because of that geographical barrier. 
Both separate populations will continue to accumulate different beneficial mutations over time to help them survive in their environment, which are likely to vary. And due to this accumulation of DNA differences over time, the two populations become so genetically different that they'd be unable to interbreed to make fertile offspring. So they're now classed as two different species. Sympatric speciation is when they are in the same area, but they are reproductively isolated due to differences in behaviour. And this could be because of a random mutation within the population that could impact reproductive behaviour, for example, and it might mean they perform different courtship rituals, or it might be that they become fertile at different times of the year. And that's the same with plants. They might suddenly have different flowering times of the year. And due to this reproductive isolation, these individuals will not reproduce together and there'll be no gene flow between those two groups in the population. And over time, those reproductively isolated populations will accumulate different mutations to the extent that their DNA will become so different that they cannot interbreed to make fertile offspring anymore if they were to start breeding together and therefore they're classed as two different species. So that is it for this topic. Hope you found it helpful. If you did, make sure you give this video a thumbs up and don't forget to subscribe.